Hey there, Cousin here, and welcome back to Always Doing. It is almost kind of sort of fall here, which makes me really excited. The leaves haven't changed yet, but they're not quite as green as they used to be. I have undergone what I consider the first rite of fall though, and that is getting my flu shot, which is always so much fun, actually, that's not joking because I get my flu shot at work at a really big hospital on the same day that everyone else at the hospital gets their flu shot. It's an amazing operation. I wish I could take pictures of it. So what they do is they set up a large room. It could hold maybe a hundred people for a class or seminar and that's with chairs and tables like desks. And what they do is they take those tables and desks and instead of being flat, they lift them at 45 degrees to act like as barriers to help guide you through the room. So you register outside, you're holding your form, and you go through the queue and they have three doctors and they look over your form and say, do you have a fever? No, excellent, great. And they make sure everything's okay. And they have whiteboards lined up and they all have flu facts for this year. And they're flu facts for doctors, so they're super interesting. And then behind those whiteboards, there's six nurses at six long tables, all waiting to jab you. And when everyone opens up, you go over there, they say hello, you put your hands on your hips because something back home in the States, I'd always get the shot up here in my shoulder, but here they actually do it down closer to the elbow. The nurse has something like a hundred preloaded needles ready to go. They give you your shot and my nurse this year was so good. I didn't even feel it when he put the needle in. And every year I swell up and depending on the, some years it's worse than others, but it's always a, a badge I wear with pride because I know I'm protecting my patients and the people around me. So get your flu shot, okay? Okay. So to the task at hand, I have my October wrap up for you guys. A couple of the books I've mentioned in other videos, so I'll be linking those up above. It's been an uneven month of reading for me. I've had some incredible reads and some others I kind of wish I could forget, but we'll get to that. In the beginning of October, a typhoon was bearing down on us and that's never fun, especially when it happens at night because you can't see really what's happening, you can only hear it. And I was really wound up, so I wanted a book that would take my mind away from all of that and I found one. It's Silent in the Grave by Deanna Rayborn. It is the first book of the Lady Julia Gray series. This is a period mystery. It takes place in Victorian England. Lady Grey is married to Edward and he dies suddenly before a party one night. His whole family has weak hearts and he wasn't doing incredibly well before so it's not a complete surprise. However, she's informed by a certain Nicholas that her husband was receiving threats and that it may not have been a natural death, he may have been murdered, and they go and they investigate. This book had me from the first line. To say that I met Nicholas Brisbane over my husband's dead body would not be entirely accurate. Edward, it should be noted, was still twitching on the floor. I was sold! That's just, yeah, sure, I'm here, let's go, take my mind off the typhoon, Let's work out the mystery. Lady Grey teams up with Brisbane to do this investigation, but she has no background in anything close, no science, no anything. So she makes mistakes. And on one hand, I'm glad that they show her making mistakes. On the other hand, some of them are really stupid mistakes and you can see where they're going to go pretty easily. And that can get a little frustrating, but it never took too much away from my enjoyment. It's a whodunit. I couldn't figure out who done it but I can never figure out who done it, so take that for what it is. I like the world building. The author doesn't overextend herself and try to show us all of Victorian England in just one novel. She makes this one corner of it very, very well, and things will, I'm sure, go out from here. It turns out the author has done a lot of research in this area, and while it never felt, oh, I need to show off all of my research to you, she does explain things like widow's weeds and putting black curtains over the windows and things that if you're truly knowledgeable about that stuff may feel a bit overexplained. It's a feminist tale at heart. I love that LGBTQIA plus characters are worked into the plot and some people have online have said, well, this wouldn't have happened in Victorian England, but you know what? In our year of 2018, I will take every single bit of feminist escapism that I can take. Thank you. If you're looking for a straight up mystery, you may be disappointed. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot of character work. There's a tiny thread of romance running through it. It's obviously going to be a series. This was fine by me. 
I liked it, but if you're looking for straight mystery, maybe you want to skip this. For whatever reason, I connect with the writing strongly, and if that first line grabbed you, then you'll probably like it too, as long as you keep the other things in mind. The next book I read is The Lonesome Bodybuilder by Motoya Yuhiko, translated by Asa Yoneda. It comes out the first week of November, and I received an advanced copy from Soft Skull Press. It's a collection of short stories as well as one novella. What I love about these stories is that they're weird, but they don't start weird. They start off completely normal, and you'll have a situation at work, or a husband and wife, and one will say something that's slightly odd, but you think, you know, life is weird. I happen to a friend of mine. But then there's another thing that makes it a little weirder, and a little weirder after that, and you slowly slide into absurdity in a really believable way. Like if there's a believable absurdity, that's what she's aiming for. I like a lot of stories in this. There's one called Q&A that's by a, an advice columnist or an agony aunt, and she, it starts off and she's at the end of her life and starts off giving fairly normal advice, but it gets weirder and weirder as you go. But my favorite story is the novella length tale. And I talked about it a bit in my most anticipated reads video for November about a husband and wife where they start looking like each other quite literally and beyond their control. And it talks about what it means to get married to someone and to keep your sense of self despite being so closely linked to another person and when you should give that up, if you should give that up, or how hard you should protect it. At first I was worried with a hundred page novella that all of these absurdities that build up quickly in the short stories would continue in ad infinitum and quickly get tiring, but that's not the case at all. The absurdities are much more spaced out, much more subtle, much more nuanced. There are subplots that really make you think, and it was an engrossing reading experience. I remember exactly where I was when I reached the end of it, and I was on a train commuting actually, and I just kind of walked off in a daze like, oh, I have so much to think about now. A lot of the stories touch on the theme of women's place in Japanese society, where women are still expected to be wives and mothers before anything else, and I just, I loved it. The translation is good. Now, I am in a weird position because I could have read this in Japanese, but instead I read it in the English translation, and it holds up really, really well. I was never tempted to back translate and the Japanese doesn't poke through anywhere. So even though I haven't seen the original Japanese, I feel confident in saying it's a good translation. If you'd like to hear me blabber on more about this book, do check out my most anticipated reads video for November, but four stars, really enjoyed it. The next book I read is also from the Japanese. It's Konbini Ningen, translated into English as Convenience Store Woman by Murata Sayaka. The Japanese cover, I'm not quite sure why it looks the way it does. I can't really explain it. It's definitely memorable though, but the English cover looks like this. The English translation is by Jinny Takemori and I've only heard good things about it. The book is about furukura Sang. She is a, I want to say Furukawa or Furukawa or something, but it's Furukura. She is a woman in her 30s who has worked at a convenience store for the past 18 years. In Japanese society, you're expected to go to college, get a quote unquote real job, get married, start a family, but she skipped pretty much all of that and went straight from high school into this quote-unquote part-time job, even though she's working full-time hours. Her family is concerned, her friends are concerned, they're always trying to nudge her to get a real job or, you know, fall in love with somebody, but what they don't realize is that the job at the convenience store is the best thing for Furukura. It, fits her personality perfectly, she thrives there, and while she doesn't always get along with other parts of society, this is one section that she can own, and she's got it. Halfway through, she meets a young man, and their relationship changes a lot of things in her life, and he is awful. He is absolutely awful, and he is the reason why I kind of wish I read this book in English instead of Japanese, because while the Japanese wasn't a big issue for me, I do have to look up words every once in a while, but that's normal for almost anything I read. 
I can't read at speed the same way I can in my native English. So he would be spewing all this toxic, horrific stuff and I had to wallow and bathe in it for much longer than I wanted to. And it's demoralizing when we're like, oh, I don't know that word, let's see what that means, to rail at. It wasn't a fun read in a second language. All in all, it's good. Just try and read it in as few sittings as possible and blow through it, and I think you'll get the most out of it that way. If you'd like to see another review of it, Jacqueline over at Six Minutes For Me read this this month as well, and I'll leave a link to her review down below. The next book I read was the 2020 Commission Report about the North Korean nuclear attacks against the United States by Jeffrey Lewis. I did a full review of this one in a two-for-one review, which I will link up and down below. As a quick summary, Lewis is a nuclear disarmament expert with a specialty in North Korea, and so he puts together a government report of how possibly North Korea and America could end up lobbing bombs at each other in the year 2020 with the current U.S. president and what that would all look like. The report is written after all of these events have happened, and it is funny in parts, it's disturbing in a lot of parts, and what gets me the most is that everything that happens before August 2018 is completely real. So sometimes you're reading and you go, oh wow, that's incredible, and you realize it's actually happened, it's not fiction. If you have any interest in novels that are told in a way slightly outside of the norm, or nuclear anything, or politics, I recommend you check out my full review so you can get the whole story. After all of the heaviness of convenience store woman, and this idea of a nuclear attack against the United States, I needed something light. So I turned to Paranormal Romance, what I thought was Paranormal Romance, let's start there, and it's The Demon Lover by Juliet Dark. It's a pseudonym for Carol Goodman. Our protagonist is Callie. She recently finished grad school and is looking to get into academia. She studies folklore and her thesis was about the demon lover in literature, and it actually got picked up for wide publication and made her slightly famous, and now she's looking for a teaching job at a university somewhere. This is made slightly more complicated because she has a long-distance boyfriend who's currently in California, and they would like to meet up in New York one day, as in New York City, but instead she ends up taking a job in upstate New York in the Catskills. She does this because this tiny college in the middle of the mountains has a folklore department that is beyond compare. She ends up finding a house that's being sold for a song and seems a bit haunted, but seems perfect. I mean, she's a folklore, gothic literature person. So she goes and she ends up getting visited by an incubus, like you do. Everything spins out from there. At the core, I see how this could be a great story, but it falls flat in oh so many areas. First of all, the world building isn't all that well done. The author throws a lot of things into this first novel. It's like, oh yeah, there's Incubi, and there's Fae, and there's vampires, and there's weird stuff going on over here, and it's a lot to take in over one novel, especially when it's all introduced in this haphazard way. And in line with that, we're introduced to a bunch of different characters, but because there's so many of them, we don't know them very well, and it muddies the narrative. One of these characters who tend to be quite one note comes in, does the thing that they need to to advance the plot, and then they fade into the background again. It's not very satisfying. Kelly is working as a professor and she's working with freshman students and she always seems to give them capital S sage advice, which doesn't ring well with me. It doesn't feel like it's coming from an authentic place when, you know, there's one student who is an orphan and she's like, oh, I lost my parents too, and it didn't feel right. And on top of all this, the author is very meta and heavy-handed. Callie is studying gothic novels and she finds herself in the middle of a gothic novel. So there are lots of parts where she's like, oh, wow, it's almost as if I'm the heroine in a gothic novel. Or, oh, if this were a gothic novel, this is what would happen next, and I got sick of it, quickly. I see where this book could go. I see how this series could become interesting. 
It should be classed more as an urban fantasy than a paranormal romance, though. Kelly doesn't make many decisions. Things just happen to her. And maybe that's also part of this gothic romance thing where it fits in well, but I just, no, I'm good. I'm gonna let this series go. The next book I read is Meet Me at the Museum by Ann Youngman. I have this as a physical copy, as you can see. And the design is really nice. On the inside here we have the museum and that line connects to a fountain pen. This is the British um, UK edition. I read this as part of Dewey's 24 hour readathon. So if you would like to see my thoughts as I read it, do check that out. It's an epistolary novel, so it's told in letters and I love epistolary novels and made it really easy to pick this up. By way of backstory, there's um, the Tulland man who is from the Middle Ages and was preserved in a peat bog, which was rare at the time because most people were cremated. So when it was discovered, uh, it went into a museum and archeologists and anthropologists have studied it extensively. Back in the day, the professor that studied it wrote a book about it and some schoolgirls in the UK were writing back and forth to him. And it's now many decades later and one of those schoolgirls school writes back to the museum saying, hey, I don't know, professor, if you're still there, but this is the way my life's going now and stuff. And the professor is long dead, but the current curator writes back and they start an exchange. They talk about their lives, they talk about things they've lost, and one of the major themes is about the direction of one's life and if you, certain decisions you make in your past limit what you do in the future and to what extent. The letters are well written. It doesn't feel like the debut book that it is. I like that the author is retired and probably close in age to those of the people who are writing, so it makes it feel more authentic, I think. So I enjoyed the reading experience until I got to the end, and I'm going to, I'm not going to spoil it, but I'm just going to say in general, I do not like it in literature when you have a cishet man and a cishet woman communicating in any way, they either have a romance, there's a will they won't they with a romance, romance is hinted. I was hoping the way that the letters went until the end that they would remain friends and not even consider anything else and they may have considered some other stuff. So I think I need to read the book Radio Silence by Alice Osman because that apparently has a platonic friendship but I'm just done with this romantic thing. It's just not needed all the time. I feel bad because this is an issue I have with literature as a whole, not with this particular book. It, I'm bothered that it falls into this trap, but mm. So I ended up giving it three stars. I enjoyed the reading experience until the end and then I got mad. But other than that, it was all right. And finally, the last book I read this month was when Death Becomes Life, Notes from a Transplant Surgeon by Joshua D. Mesrich. I received this as an advanced copy. It actually comes out in January. So what I'm gonna do right after this is I'm going to film a full review of it that I can put up closer to the release date. But for now, I'll say that this is a book that it's not a history of transplant surgery, nor is it a memoir of him, nor is it just full of patient cases. It's a combination of all three and they're woven together very well. I was never mad when it changed or go back to the other thing, it all hangs together. Transplant surgery, when it first started, was pretty much a rogue field because it's kind of like you're making a Frankenstein monster, right? In the very early days of the field, brain death wasn't defined. It wasn't a thing, it wasn't recognized as dying. So they could only take organs from people whose hearts had stopped for a particular length of time, which makes transplantation harder and all of that stuff. So learning about that history was really interesting. His writing style is easy to understand no matter how much medicine you know, and I enjoyed it. The full review will be coming up in January right around its release. So instead of giving it like a star rating right now, I'll just give you a wordless review of, how's that work? So we're finally done with all of the books I read in October. Have you read any of these books? Are you looking forward to reading any of them? Let's have a chat down in the comments. Subscribe if you're new and thank you to all of my new subscribers. 
I think some of you have found me via Aldi Books or Sean the Book Maniac, and I'm so happy to have you, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!